Thank you for watching this online class presentation from Cedarville University. Cedarville University has been named a National Center of Academic Excellence in Cyber Operations. This prestigious designation allows our cybersecurity students more career and professional opportunities. We invite you to learn more at cedarville.edu. We finished last time talking about this guy, uh, Jacob especially, but that led us then to the question, why is it that God would call himself over and over and over again the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? And so I want to know what you think about that or what you've come up with. What does it tell you about him that he identifies as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? I know it was the last thing we looked at, but uh, help me out here. What do you got? Somebody talk to me. Yeah, I, I think that's a pretty good way to say it. He's, he's the God of... We think of Abraham as a good guy, and Abraham is a relative good guy when you compare him to Jacob, right? Even though he fails and fails and fails and fails. God loves Abraham's, but he also loves Jacob's, this guy who's really, really a scoundrel, right? And, and everybody in between. And so it's a pretty amazing statement that he would call himself that. Do you identify more with Abraham or Jacob? Noah, since you're talking to me, who are you? If we weren't going to call you Noah, what do we call you, Abraham or Jacob? Jacob. Jacob. Anybody? So let's just go around the room here. Uh, Abraham's first of all. How many Abrahams? What's, your name is Abraham? Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll give you a pass, okay? <laughs> Jacob's? Yeah, yeah, I think so. Me too, right? So that, that's really a comfort to me. Um, so let me, let me just say I had another slide like this. Abraham seems redeemable, but why would God work with the likes of Jacob, right? Because Abraham seems good from the start, but when you take a look at Jacob, not that we have four Jacobs up here, but if you take a snapshot of him at various points in his life, I, I think that most of the time he's pretty blue, right? We can't know for sure, but he certainly is acting like a blue person almost all the way until the end. Right? So that leads us then, after we've seen Jacob and we've seen Abraham, that leads us then to this. And it's not Isaac, it's actually Joseph. Even though the, the name is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, in the stories of Genesis, Isaac gets, gets a little bit and Joseph gets a big bit, right? From 37 to 50, probably the largest chunk in the book of Genesis goes to Joseph. So we've seen that Abraham is here, we've seen Jacob is here, and now the question is, where is Joseph going to fit? The natural question is to say, well, let's see, hmm, is Joseph a good guy? Is he more like Abraham? Or is he going to be sort of a rascal, more like Jacob? And the answer is actually none of the above. He's going to be a completely different character, which I think is part of the reason why God is, again, is being very selective here about who he's, whose story he's telling. Uh, Isaac might be an awful lot like Abraham or Jacob, and, and God says, no, no, we've had enough of that. We need something else to, to give you a little bit more information in a way you wouldn't expect. So let's dive into Joseph here and take a look at him. I'm going to call him the Photoshopped Patriarch. Now, I know that is not a, a, a very flattering term. When we think about Photoshopping, right, you can find all sorts of examples of it. Even this one's a little, little snarky, you'll notice if you take a look at it. This kit acts as eyeliner, eyeshadow, mascara, all the way down, and then over here, immortalize your beauty. No one will ever know, as long as you never let anyone see you in person again, right? It's kind of a, kind of a joke here that this is a false, fake sort of thing to do. And even Megan Trainer tells us, you know, get rid of that Photoshop stuff, right? So we know it's a bad idea, so given the negative press, why would I call him this? Well, I still think it works, and I, and I think it's one of the keys to understanding the role that he plays in this book. Right? So hang on with me, stay with me, and see if you can figure out why I call him this. Right? So let's start quickly with um, this final section of the book. Remember, we were breaking it down into 12 sections. We weren't doing that, but Moses did that, and we called the first... Uh, six sections, uh, one through six, and that was Genesis 1 to 11, and then we did from 12 to 50 as another six sections, and this is the sixth of six in the second half, or the twelfth of twelve, right? The, this is like the finale, the grand finale, and there are a lot of chapters to it. And what we're going to find here is Jacob's family results 
in Joseph's conflict with the evil one. So I hope it kind of reminds you, right, of where we started in that sort of idea, conflict with the evil one, and in his deliverance of his family for blessing. So we're pretty familiar with Joseph as we start out because of that beautiful, beautiful coat, right? This is one of my favorite things in third grade Sunday school. You could use every crayon in the box because it was just beautiful, right? And you could put all sorts of colors on it and his father gives it to him. And if it's not just for the coat, but also that uh, those dreams which, uh, which God gives to him. Now, in, in this whole situation with that background that you know, um, the question is, is Joseph to blame for his family situation? Because we know that his brothers hate him. They hate him so much they're going to get rid of him. Now, it's kind of funny when you read through what commentators have to say about Joseph. A lot of them will go off on, on tangents like he was an arrogant, prideful young man. But I think we have to be careful about that kind of conclusion because the text actually doesn't say that. The, the only clue that the text gives us about why there's this family dysfunction and family tension is because his brothers hated him because they knew that his father loved him best. Now, that's not a good thing. I mean, if this coat of many colors really is uh, not only just a beautiful coat, but maybe some even think a coat of authority, uh, like, like Jacob put Joseph in charge or gave him some authority over it, you can understand why the other brothers would, would hate this and not like this. But even if that's true, that's on Jacob, not Joseph per se, right? So I, I want to kind of at least leave the story a little neutral at this point and not assume anything bad into Joseph's life. I think the thing that we should take away is what the scripture says at the end of this first 10 or 11 verses, and that's this. When he does have this dream about the sun and moon and stars bowing down to him, he tells it to his father, and his father says, do you, do you really think your mother and I and your brothers are going to come bow down to you? Right? And, and Joseph's there like, well, I don't know. I just had the dream. I don't know what it means. And I think it's amazing the way the text says, his brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the matter in mind. Right? Like Jacob says, do you really think we're going to come and bow down to you? Get out of here. But then what? But then it's like he said to himself, is this really true? Right? He kept the matter in mind. Because is it true? The answer Yes, it's absolutely true. Now, not his mother, because his mother's dead, but if his mother had been alive, everybody would be bound down to him because he's second in command of the entire world, basically. We're going to find out in a little bit, okay? Now, I don't know if this reminds you of anybody else, but can you, can you think of another wonder child who was just, you know, growing up and parents thought, whoa, what is going on with this kid? Like, specifically, a mother who kind of treasured these things in her heart, right? Didn't she know I had to be in my father's house, but his mother treasured all these things in her heart. It's like, what is going on with this boy? I mean, I know he's going to be a special boy, but I wonder if Jacob and Mary here are feeling the same way about these, these offspring. Right? So let's move on. Take a look at the second part of chapter 37, and that is this. The brothers offer plans concerning little Joe. So let's bring the brothers out on the stage. There they are, okay? And they don't like him, they want to get rid of him, and two brothers in particular say, hey, I got an idea. Who are those brothers who have ideas about what to do with him? Come on, just give me names. Who's the first one? He's the oldest one, little hint. Yeah, Reuben comes along and says, hey, I got an idea, let's do this. And then another one comes along, who's that? Yeah, it's Judah, right? And so Reuben is the oldest, Judah is there. Which brother is the most influential leader? Wh whose plan do they follow? The answer is they follow Judah, right? So the story kind of revolves around him just a little bit because where we're going to go next in chapter 38 is all about Judah. Now again, commentators are kind of funny about this. They'll say the story of Joseph is in 37 and in 39 to 50. And they leave out 38. It's like, what, what, did Moses get distracted here for a second and just leave off the story? How in the world is the story of Judah relayed? Well, let's take a look at it. In chapter 38, there's a whole discussion about this sin. Now, if you read the chapter, you know what I'm talking about, right? This, this is one of the ugliest, nastiest, most disgusting kind of a story that, that we've read so far. And if you read through it, it's really, really strange because... Uh, one of his daughters, Tamar, uh, 
uh, doesn't have children. Of course, her first husband dies, and her second husband dies, according to the way the customs work at this time. Uh, the third husband, the third boy of Jacob, should marry her, right? The first one's name Ur, the second one's name uh, uh, Onan, and the third is Shelah. Obviously, he did not have the spiritual gift of naming boys, right? <laughs> None of those, nobody, no boy wants me to name any of those things. Uh, uh, but, but, but the point is that, that as Sheila gets older, she should marry him, but, uh, but Jacob saying, uh, or Judah saying, no, I'm not going to let that happen. Uh, so she plays the role of the prostitute while he's down shearing his sheep. She, she plays the role of the prostitute. She goes in and sleeps with her. With her. He does. And uh, he doesn't know it's she. Right? Again, I don't understand all this. Maybe the tents are so dark or whatever. But the point is that a couple months later, she's expecting, and he says, ah, this is my chance to get rid of her. Uh, so let's bring her out and let's, let's stone her, right? And she says, yeah, that's true. I probably deserve to die. But the, the guy by whom I'm expecting is the one who owns this staff, right? And everyone recognizes that it's his. So he says, oh, she's more righteous than I, blah, 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 blah. I guess we can't kill her. And it's like, wow, what is this story here for? This, this is not the kind of thing you want to mark and say, hey, let's have devotions out of this every morning. It makes me feel so good, right? You think, oh, that's a really disgusting story. Why, why is that there? And you can't really know until you keep going. So notice the comparison between 38 and 39, right? What's the story in 39 all about? It's a big story, a big famous story. Maybe you can't recall the number right now, but if we went there, you'd know the answer. It's all the story about Joseph and Potiphar's wife, right? You see the similarity a little bit here? Let me put it like this. Chapter 39 is this. Oh, I'm sorry. It's the, the fonts don't show up very well, do they? You can see a little bit better over here. Can you see the number there? Oh, does that help if you see that? Does that help? Which, which is easier, this, this one or this one? This one or this one? You feel like you're at the doctor's office here? <clears throat> Obviously, this one, why? Got a little bit of background to it, right? The, the, the numbers are the same, the fonts are the same, the colors are the same. It's just that when you put a little bit of background around it, all of a sudden you can see 39 really clearly. This is exactly what 38 is. 38 is the background of 39 so that you can see it clearly. If you just saw chapter 39 in the story of Joseph and Potiphar's wife, you might not appreciate it for what it is. You might think this is the way everybody behaves. But when you've got 38 behind it, you say, no, no, no. Here's the way the brothers behave, and here's the way the other brother behaves. So already then in 37, 38, and 39, we've got kind of this comparison going on, and we can come back and we can ask this question, what does God value more highly in a leader? We see what the boys value, right? The boys don't choose Reuben, they choose Judah. We're not told exactly why, but evidently Judah is the guy who has the charisma or or the leadership skills, or the confidence, or whatever, the boys say, yeah, Judah, he's our guy, right? H how does God feel about that? And the answer is, well, uh, does God take leadership, or does he take purity? And the answer is, God's going to choose Joseph, not Judah, to rule over all these brothers and to bless them and the nations of the earth, right? So the focus now then, the whole point of chapter 38 is just to give us a little bit more insight about 39 and the story of Joseph. So 38 really is about Joseph in this way. So <clears throat> let's take a look at where we go next. And that, of course, is this. God's selection of Joseph demonstrated in his providential rise to leadership. Now, when I use the word providential, what I mean, of course, is that God himself is doing it, right? Uh, it's bolded, it's italicized, because that's what I want you to catch here. God is the one who does this. How do we know that? Well, let's take a look at the very first story. The very first story is chapter 40, story about the butcher and the baker and the candlestick maker, or something like that. Okay, the cupbearer and the baker. Now, what I want you to see in chapter 40 is that it's a fairly long chapter, right? It goes all the way here and all the way down here. And basically what happens is that Joseph is thrown in prison because of Potiphar. And uh, while he's there, he interprets dreams for these different guys, right? And the different guys, he says to one guy, you're going to die and you're going to live. And I just have one request. When you get out of here, go to Pharaoh and say to him, I am here unjustly. And the guy says to him, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, uh, absolutely, right? 
And so we go through all the drama and all the story of chapter 40, and we get down here to the very last verse, and it says, the chief cupbearer, however, he did not remember Joseph, he forgot him. Now, from a literary standpoint, you wonder, what in the world does this chapter contribute to the whole, to the whole story? This is, just, this is just silly. In fact, if Moses had taken this to his comp professor or to his editor, they would have said, you know, chapter 40 doesn't really carry the storyline along at all. Just chop it out. We can make it shorter. More people will read it. Right? And Moses says, no, 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 I really think chapter 40 needs to be in there. Why? Well, because he wants us to know that this rise to leadership is not because of any human intervention. It's only because of God. It's a providential rise to leadership. You say, is that important? Just hold on. Yeah, it's very important. And not only is it important because of that, but just imagine this for a second. Just, just use your imagination just for a second. And imagine if Jacob had been in prison, how would Jacob have gotten out? Just use your imagination. How would Jacob have gotten out of prison? He would have bribed somebody. He'd have manipulated somebody. He would have Jacobed his way out. How does Joseph get out? And the answer is, he doesn't. He doesn't, he doesn't resort to any human devices. He doesn't resort to any leadership books, any strategies. Any, you know, it's just like, man, if God doesn't do it, he stays there, and that's where he is. But of course, then God does help him and he does get out. So let's take a look at that story. His providential rise to leadership. And I want to show you three passages. 41, 40 to 41, which is this. This is the first of the three. You will oversee my household and all my people will submit to your commands. Only I, the king, will be greater than you. We've kind of skipped over the seven skinny cows and the seven fat cows. I trust you know that. And Pharaoh is so impressed, he says, you are going to be second in command. So he's second in command of Egypt. Now, what you may not know is that Egypt at this point in time is like the superpower of the ancient world. So it's like being vice president of the United States, and I've had some missionary friends who live overseas for a number of years, and they say, the vice president of the United States is kind of like second in command of the world, right? In the sense that it's, if it is, in fact, the world's biggest superpower, it, it wields influence over everything. And that's exactly where he is. Second thing, what well, you notice about Joseph here is this. Verse 46, Joseph was 30 years old when he began serving Pharaoh, king of Egypt. 30 years old at the start. And the third thing is this, verse 57. People from every country came to Joseph in Egypt to buy grain because the famine was severe throughout the earth. So he ends up blessing his own nation and all nations of the earth with bread. Now, I don't, I don't know if this means anything to you or if again you're having flashbacks or you can understand who this is about, but does it, does it remind you of just like anyone at all? I don't know if you can think of who this might be reflecting or not, but it's pretty amazing, right? The details that Moses give us may not have meant too much to the original readers, but as we look back, it's like, whoa, we're, we're starting to see some reflections here, right? And, and watch this, the further we go, we get to 42 to 47, and this is one of the largest chunks of the book where Joseph tests his brothers. Now, you wonder, why is this so big? Well, take a look at what's here. Actually, he makes them sweat bullets, right? I mean, you, you, again, I trust that you know what goes on here. Uh, he, he could have simply said to his brothers, hey, guys, I'm your little brother Joe, right? But he doesn't do that. Uh, he doesn't do that. He plays along for a long time. And so you wonder to yourself, well, is he vengeful? Right? Is he saying, hey, <laughs> they, they, they did me dirt and now I'm going to get back? Is he, is he looking for justice? Is he just enjoying the charade? Is he developing character, sort of a spiritual you know, uh, approach to it? And I, I, don't, I don't think that's it. I think we have to ask this, this question. This is the key. What surely has kept him awake at night for 20 years? So put yourself back in this story. Uh, just for a second, <clears throat> take Joseph off the flannel graph board, if that's how you remember him. Make him into a real person. Pretend you are in his shoes for a second, right? And pretend that your family sold you into slavery. I mean, it's, it's so beyond, you know, the possibility for most of it, it's hard to even imagine. But imagine your family hates you so much, they get rid of you and sell you into slavery. So how do you think Joseph's going to take that? 
Well, Joseph's going to go to sleep every night and he's going to cry himself to sleep. Right? And we know this from victims of abuse and, and you know, you see the stories in the news. How do people respond to this? It's a traumatic thing, right? Because you, what everyone always says is, what's so wrong with me? Why did my family throw me away like a piece of trash? Why did they do that to me? You better believe that bothers him for 20 years. So that when the brothers come back, the only question on his mind is, would you guys do that again if you had a chance? Would you? Now, the trouble with that question, would you do it again, is that there's no good way to get at the answer. Because Joseph, who is second in command of the entire world, has a row of bodyguards going down this way from him, and a row of bodyguards going down this way from him, and they have six-foot razor-sharp swords, right? And Joseph's there in front of his brothers and say, hey guys, I'm your little brother Joe, and uh, you know, when you sold me to slavery 20 years ago, I just want to know, would you do that again? And all the bodyguards are looking down like, like this, you know, what, what are they gonna say? This is not a real, this is, you, you, you can't get an honest answer here. It's like, yeah, you know what? We've been meaning to get back to you on that. And uh, uh, as it turns out, yeah, we're sorry for that, right? That, that's, not how, that's not gonna work. So how do you do it? Well, that's where we go to the next question. Why use little Ben? Why use little Ben? Well, because Ben is also the other son of Rachel, right? His father's favorite. So what you have to have is you have to be able to recreate the situation. You have to have a pseudo-Joseph, and Ben is the very best one. You have to put another son of Rachel in a position of jeopardy to see what the brothers are going to do. And so that's the whole reason here for all this charade. We've got to put Ben in a position of jeopardy and see what the boys are going to do with him. And so the, the, the silver cup is found in his sack and everybody tears their clothes. And the question is, where does the answer come? I'm going to skip right to the chase here and get to chapter 44. You get to chapter 44, um, the boys all come back and one of the boys starts to speak. Take a wild guess who it is. Which boy starts to speak? Judah, right? He's the other leader. And so Judah starts to speak, and, and this is where we are in chapter 44. Then Judah went up to him and said, Please, my Lord, let your servant speak a word to my Lord. Do not be angry with the servant, though you're equal to Pharaoh himself. And he starts to talk, and he talks, and he talks, and he talks, blah, 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 blah. It's a long section here, right? If we read it, take us several minutes to do it. And, and I get the impression that Joseph is just there saying, Uh-huh, that's really nice. Uh, that's, not, that's not what I'm listening for. Oh, uh, that's really nice. That's a nice sentiment, but that's not what I'm listening for. And then all of a sudden, boom, Judah finally gets to it. And where he gets to it, I think, is right here at the end of the chapter where he says this. Now then, please let your servant remain here as my Lord's slave, right? Let me stay here as your Lord's slave in place of the boy and let the boy return with his brothers. So do you see what just happened here? Like 20 years ago, what Judah said was, I hate that son of Rachel so much, let's sell him and get rid of him. Let's throw him down there into prison, all, right, all I care. And now 20 years later, what does Judah say? Judah says, no, 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 no. If, if somebody has to go to prison, let, let me go and let the boy go. Let me take his place and let the boy go. And then what's fascinating to me is he says, how can I go back to my father if the boy is not with me? No, do not let me see the misery that would come upon my father. Now you think about that, and if I were Joseph, I would say, no, wait a minute, he never said he was sorry for what he did to me. Well, he's not going to say that because he doesn't know that Joseph is right there in front of him, right? But he does know that when you take the beloved son of the father and you treat that son badly, you hurt the father in just the same way. And so what he's saying here is, I repent, I change, I don't want to sacrifice that boy, I want to sacrifice my st myself instead, because I don't want to hurt the father. Right? And at that point, this repentance is complete, this change is complete, and Joseph says, that's it, that's it, I've heard what I want to know, you would not do it again, you have changed. Right? And so he sends all the Egyptians out of the room, says, okay guys, I have a little secret I want to tell you, I am little Joe. Now, I would have loved to have seen the look on their face at that point, right, wouldn't you? 
And they said, oh, no, we're dead now. And he says, no, 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 you're not dead. You meant it for evil, but God meant it for good, right? Which in some ways is sort of the theme of the whole book. Humans just keep messing things up, and yet God keeps manipulating it around and making it good. Right? So what happens next then is this. <clears throat> Who is this guy? And that's part of what this story is telling us. Who is this guy? Well, so far we've seen he is a pure, faithful beloved son of his father, who endures suffering and rejection from his people, who later responds with grace and forgiveness. And as you take a look at him, you, you wonder. He rescues his family and the entire family, the entire world. Who is this guy, Joseph? Now, for the most important lesson of the day, this question then is for you. Isaac, nope, Joseph, right? We're, we're not doing Isaac, we're not telling his story. He's cut out. Let's take Joseph and give him 14 chapters. Why did Moses decide to basically ignore Isaac and give Joseph the largest and final story of the book? Or to answer it another way, or ask another way, what is the purpose of Joseph in the book? I think you can probably answer it now, but take 30 seconds, talk to your friend, why Joseph, not Isaac? What's the story? What's the purpose of little Joe in this book? What is Joseph here in 37 to 50? He is the fleshing out of 315, isn't he? It's like we're going to have someone come along and smash the head of the snake. And by the way, would you like to know what he looks like? And the answer is he's a pure, faithful guy who his brothers reject, but uh, whom is patient and forgiving, and he will bless all nations of the earth. That's who this 315 guy is. And what you've got here in Genesis 37 to 50 is the perfect finish and completion to a book that is all wound together in one big idea. It's a really coherent story, right? We're finishing the storyline well here. So that's what he's doing. And in fact, notice this. Notice that little chart in your notes. I have this, that the seed will test and deliver his brothers to produce repentance, to avoid the same mistake, and accept him. Now, I know it's sort of a convoluted sentence, but you can see the way it, it, it plays out in Joseph's life, right? Joseph does all those things. And in fact, in Jesus' life, will test and deliver maybe from seven years of tribulation, if we can trust the book of Revelation, and I think we can. His brothers, that is the whole nation, to produce repentance there, to avoid the mistake of selling Joe Jesus for 30 pieces of silver and rather accept him. Because what's actually happening here in Joseph is this perfect picturing of the seed who's gonna come, so that when he comes, you won't miss him. So, with that then, let me add another couple of little charts and say this. We've seen Noah and Isaac. I'm going to put Joseph up there. And notice that with Noah and Isaac, we kind of faded him out, a little, little orangey there. But I'm going to leave little Joe bright white because he is the very best picture in this book of what that seed's going to look like. Or um, we could also say this. And let's talk about the Photoshopping thing again, OK? Um, do you understand why I say he's photoshopped? L let me ask you a couple of really, really specific questions. Be careful how you answer. Think about it carefully first, okay? Is Joseph a sinner? It's always easy to answer that, right? Because all of our theology combines on us, and you, you, know, you know that everybody's a sinner. So is Joseph a sinner? Yes, he's a sinner. Okay, we got it. Now, more important question more careful answer. In the book of Genesis, is Joseph a sinner? You see the difference in the questions? In the book of Genesis, in the literary development of the book, is Joseph a sinner? And this is why I wanted to be so careful back in the very beginning to say, hmm, this conflict in the family, uh, is that little Joe's fault or is it somebody else's fault? And a lot of people are quick to say, oh, he's an arrogant little guy. Well, I know another young boy who had trouble with his brothers who didn't believe him too, and I don't think it was his fault, and that's why I don't want to 
say it's his fault here. And besides, as you read through the rest of the book, what do you learn about Joseph? Every, everywhere you go, he's forgiving, he's faithful, he's just, he's gracious, he endures unjust treatment, right, carefully and faithfully. And so I just want to say here, when it comes to Photoshopping, is Joseph a sinner? Yes. In the book, is he a sinner? I think the answer is no. I think that Moses has selectively taken out the parts of Joseph that don't look so good so that he is the perfect reflection of Messiah when he comes. Now, that's why in the very beginning I had Abraham up here, Jacob over here, and Joseph down here, right? Joseph is not even on the same discussion of these two guys. Abraham is a really good guy. Jacob is a really scoundrel. Joseph is a completely different character because he's not even necessarily... I, know, I want to be really, really careful the way I say this because Joseph is historically true, but it's not a complete picture of him. All the blemishes have been taken out because his role is different, right? We're, uh, what, what we're trying to demonstrate to you here is what this ultimate seed is going to look like. Does that make sense? Any questions about the, the role of Joseph and what he plays here in the photoshopping metaphor? Talk to me here. We good? You good? Okay. Then... Let's do this. <clears throat> Let's go on to the very last chapter because this is sort of a fascinating little prophecy as well. Genesis 49 and verse 10. The King James says it like this. Uh, the scepter shall not depart from Judah nor the lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh comes. It's a very, very kind of vague, enigmatic statement here. But where it comes is this. In chapter 49, Jacob is dying and he is giving blessings to all of his kids, right? So he looks at them and he's saying, based upon your uh, behavior, I'm gonna predict this about you for the future. So he comes to his son Judah and this is what he says. The scepter will not depart from Judah, nor the lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh comes. Now, as it turns out, Shiloh, just like Isaac and Abraham, is a name that can also be translated with its other meaning, right? And what it is, in the NIV, it says this, <clears throat> the scepter will not depart from Judah, and, or the ruler's scepter from his feet, until he comes to whom it belongs, right? This is what Shiloh means. So I don't think it's necessarily a person per se, but, but a description of he comes to whom it belongs. Now, in the sentence here, uh, what is the antecedent of it? Till he comes to whom what belongs? The scepter, right? So let, let, let's see what's going on here. Let me, let me see if I can illustrate it like this. <clears throat> what it's saying basically is this, that we're going to have a scepter. Now, we've talked about this before at the very beginning, right? Adam had the scepter. He lost it. But we also know, we also know that there are going to be kings who come from Israel who are going to hold scepters. So the very first king, again, be careful how you answer this one. The very first king who was a son of David, who held the scepter... Uh, I, should, I, I said that wrong. The very first king of Israel, who was from Judah, was David, right? So uh, for right now, we're going to let you be David, okay? Good. David, so I'm going to give you the scepter. Be careful, because it's all sorts of power, right? All kinds of incredible power happen with this. Yeah, you can click. No, no well, be careful what you're doing with this power now, okay? <clears throat> all right? This has power, right? And so based upon, yes... <laughs> Here, <clears throat> based upon the power that's in the scepter, uh, you should be really, really careful. Because it's really important, right? True. And, and, and let's just say that David is getting old now. David's, you know, like he's reigned 40 years, he's ready to die, and he's ready to pass it on to his son Solomon, right? So he's getting ready to pass it on to his son Solomon just around. But before he does, what kind of a little speech should David give to Solomon based upon this verse? about the scepter. Use your imagination, take a look at the verse, tell me what speech he should give to him based upon this verse. Take this scepter and what? Keep it until the one to whom it belongs comes. Keep it until the one to whom it belongs comes is close. I would say that. I'd say, look, this has all sorts of power. Be careful. Use it well. Don't do anything stupid with it like, you know, like marry a thousand women? Not that you would, would you? No, no, right? 
and I mean, because you, you wouldn't do anything stupid with it either, right? You, like, you wouldn't not. kill your best friend or sleep with his wife? No, that'd be stupid. Yeah, no. yeah you wouldn't <clears throat> do that, David, would you? Well. S well, so be <laughs> careful and don't do anything stupid because you can do a lot of things with that power. And obviously, um, you know, we're worried about the dumb things <laughs> that you might do. So use it well and, because it doesn't really belong to you, right? So when Solomon gets ready to die, he gives it down here to his son, Rehoboam. Now, this is the same speech, right? Rehoboam, be careful. This doesn't belong to you. Don't do anything stupid with it, like split the whole kingdom in two. Okay? You wouldn't do that, would you? No. No. So, okay, give it to him, and he does it as soon as he gets it. <laughs> <laughs> so, Rehoboam, you can give it to Huzaboam down there. Uh, yeah, same thing. Huzaboam, you can give it to Dingaboam, and Dingaboam, give him to wear the boam, and uh, keep. Oh, oh, stop. Right oh, my goodness. Look. Oh, wow. Look at, look at that. This is so, wow. I can't, it's just, it fits so well right there. Do you I see that? Know, right? Isn't that amazing? I know. It fits so well. Now, wh wh what kind of a hand does this scepter fit in? Tell me, what kind of a hand does this scepter, where, where do you want the scepter to be? The one that has all this power, where do you want it to be? You want it to be in the hand of someone who will not use it for stupid stuff, right? <laughs> for selfish ends, you want this power to be in the hand of one who is so pure that they will only use the power for good and for the benefit of others and not for selfish ends, right? I would say this is a hand where it actually belongs. Okay? Make sense? So let's, let's go back to our, sorry, you just lost it. <laughs> you just lost, let's, let's go back here then and let me say this then, that the leader of the nation of Israel and the leaders of, the leader of all nations will come from a line of Judah. That's what Genesis 49 is saying. Because notice it says, and the obedience of all the nations, of the nations, is his. Now again, what does that remind you of? Whenever you see nations, plural, what should it remind you of? Genesis 11 and Babel and Genesis 12, 3 and the solution. So evidently, from Judah will come the guy who's going to rule over all nations, right? So you can see here, even in this fairly enigmatic or vague statement, this is really a specific prophecy. So I'm going to say Genesis 12, 2, the leader of the nation of Israel, right? Because remember 12, 2 was the nation. And then 12, 3, the one who will bless all nations by providing salvation and leadership for them. Or here's another way we could say it. Let's take Genesis 49 and plop it down on top of here. And I hope that as you take a look at those levels, you can understand how each one of them contributes to the big idea. In Genesis 3.15, we're going to have someone who's going to smash the head of the snake, right? And get the scepter back. Who's going to be a son of whom? Eve, right? In Genesis 12, that son will also be a son of Abraham. In Genesis 15, this unconditional, right, still son of Abraham. And in Genesis 49, it'll also be a son of Judah, exactly. Or here's another way we could do it. Come down like this. So with Genesis 3, uh, a son of Eve. Genesis 12, Abraham. And now Genesis 49, Judah. Does that part make sense to you? Okay, so what part of what I want you to see just from even this little exercise, again, is the amazing coherence of this book. As we read through, remember all that torturous reading of Genesis 4 to 11, and even then, some of the stories just didn't seem to quite fit, but every one of them relates to the big idea if you understand what's actually going on.